Yep, he cut that pretty close. <laughs> I thought I crunched it that time. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was a little bit close for comfort, I think. Now this one here, we're going to drop that way. This one has got a little bit more issues going on up top, and I'll show you. This is the kind of tree that gets funky to cut, because it comes and it leans that way, but then it leans that way, and all the weight is up there. Now, it would go that way pretty good, but I don't want to put it over there because I don't want to have it all tangled with that. Right now, I want to take a couple trees down. So. The issue with this one is it's got a lot of branches that go in behind that cherry tree. Now if I just try to pull it this way, it's going to just get entangled. we got two forks there and that fork there, and they're going to want to get tangled up. And as you can see, I don't want it to fall over here. <laughs> I think I'm going to still try to cable it this way, but when I notch it, I'll do it in such a way, when I'm cutting the back cut, that I'm going to try to have that spin right on the stump and come down this way. That's the plan. <laughs> anyway. Those branches were holding that tree from falling down. I didn't want to cut any more. I had almost no hinge left. The come along got it pulling in the right direction, but it did not want to fall down. Like I said, I didn't want to eliminate the hinge entirely because then the tree can do whatever it wants. But by having that little hinge point there, it still kept it from coming down. Those branches were holding it and I cut as much as I dared and then Lori cranked it and as you can see it just came down but it didn't spin quite like I'd hoped it would. It still fell where I wanted, you know. So when you're cutting one you really got to pay attention to what the branches are doing. They're getting entwined like that. They can hold that tree. You can be entirely cut through at the stump and it just stays there. If you don't have a come along on it, that's when it gets really dangerous. But I feel pretty confident with the come along. As you can see, really nobody was in harm's way. Come along, pulled it down, not a problem. Still gets exciting though. <laughs> so this is what we have so far. The stack is four and a half feet tall by eight and a half feet wide by almost 17 feet long. So I'm guessing it's somewhere between five and six cords. Yep, it's all put up. I'm going to get that tarp put over the top of it. Still got all of that down there to stack. And then, we've got about ten more trees to take down. I'm going to cut them up, split them up, stack them up for next year. And then when I have about four cords or so set aside, I'll sell the rest of it. It's pretty good though, huh? Look at that. And we love doing it. Love it. Look at that. <laughs> Recently in my videos, I talked about my compass and I've showed my compass. So I've gotten a lot of people asking if I would give some instruction on that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just basically going to do a very, very simplistic instruction. But these simple principles is what I follow to get myself out of the woods. I don't get all involved with the high-tech stuff about all the coordinates and degrees and all this stuff that would be involved with an orienteering course. I just follow very, very basic instruction. Okay, 
What I'm going to do, what I'm going to share with you is what I share with others when I take somebody out in the woods that is relying on me. They're following me in, they're following me out. I always make sure that they know how to get themselves out of the woods. And if they're unfamiliar with the woods, the only way to do that is with the compass and if they trust it. So I'm just going to show you what I show them. Now one thing that I have heard over and over throughout my lifetime regarding compasses is because the compass has an N for north and an S for south and so on, that someone will take the compass out of their pocket and go, well, right now it says north is over there. And then they turn it like this and it says north is over there. And they're going by the letter, N for north, S for south. Those letters mean absolutely nothing until you set them to the direction your needle is pointing in. All right. So I take my compass out. The needle sets itself and points north, but according to the letters on the compass, it's showing north is over there. The letters mean absolutely nothing until I align them with the needle. Now the N is pointing north. Now these letters, west, east, south, mean something. When I take a compass reading, I never have to rotate this because I know that the needle's always going to point north, and I trust that. And opposite of north is south. And then on the left side of north is west, and the right side is east. And a good way to remember that and not get them confused is picture this, okay? So here's north, and the needle points north. Opposite is south. So you're looking at that, and then just take the word we, W-E, okay? Pointing north, left of that is W, to the right is E, west and east, okay? You're never going to spell it backwards. You're not going to go E-W, okay? So I keep that in my mind. That way I never ever get them confused, okay? Just something simple that works for me. Whenever I've taken someone out in the woods, maybe we go on a hike, we're way out in the woods, I'll stop and I'll ask them, if something happens to me right now, I drop dead, do you know how to get yourself out of here? Kind of a wake-up call. Because they went out in the woods following me, expecting to follow me out. If you ever find yourself out in the woods in a situation like that, you got turned around, maybe you didn't take a compass reading on the way in so you don't know which way to head out or you don't have a compass at all, you can get very panicky very fast and panic, once panic sets in, it's very hard to have any wits about you and make proper decisions. You're just going to want to run and that you don't want to do that couple things to consider here. Time to stop and slow down, just think and go, all right, when I was walking in, was the sun shining? If so, where was it? Did I see the sun in, ahead of me? Did I see my shadow in front of me? Was my shadow on my right? Let's just say we we're walking in. Oh yeah, I remember the sun was on my left side of my face here. The shadow was on my right, and if I wasn't out there all day, because the sun's going to rise in the east and set in the west, so it's going to move. But if I was only out there for a little while, the sun was on my left, well, come out with the sun on your right cheek. If my shadow was in front of me, come out with my shadow behind me. If it's not a sunny day at all, you won't have the luxury of that God's given compass out there. When I'm out in the woods on a sunny day, I never have to take my compass out. I know it rises in the east and it sets in the west, and in the middle of the day, it's heading south. The way that the compass works, 
the reason why I can spin this around and spin it around and have it all over the place, but every time that I take it out, that needle spins and points to magnetic north is because it's magnetic and it will point to metal. So rules that apply here is when you're holding your compass, hold it level, as level as possible. If you have a cheap compass and it's tilted like that, that needle might get hung up and it's going to read inaccurately. Hold it away from your body. Don't hold it right near you. If you have a big belt buckle, it's going to point right at your belt buckle. If you have a gun slung over your shoulder and you're holding it like this, it's probably going to point to your gun. If you're standing next to your vehicle, it's going to point right at your vehicle. Okay? So get away from your vehicle a little bit. Hold this away from your body. If you have a bunch of keys in your pocket and you're taking a compass reading like that, it might point to your keys, okay? Keep that in mind. Two rules, keep it away from metal and keep it level. As you can see, basic compass operation is very, very simple. The key is to take a compass reading before you go in, know what direction you're heading so you can head in the opposite direction coming out. You don't have to spend a lot of money. This was a very cheap compass, and I've had it for so many years that all the little numbers and everything on here are worn off. But I still trust it to get me out of the woods. What I do not do is rely on any kind of electronic device to save my life. Okay? I don't care if my phone has a compass on it. I'm not working on a GPS or anything like that. All of those devices are great, but I'm not going to depend on those to save my life. I'd rather depend on this. Follow these few simple guidelines that I've showed you here today. You'll get yourself out of the woods. Got to stay safe out there, man. All righty, time for the Sunday Q&A. I'm going to jump right into it. First question, are you going to put a star point on your log splitter? No, I'm not. The reason is I don't want every single log I split, split into four pieces. All right. If I put a log on this big, I'm only going to split it in half most of the time. Even some of the really big ones, I might only split in half. When I was using the Kitchen Queen 480, I would put some rounds in there this big, okay? On a winter night when it's 10 below zero outside, <laughs> I want to stuff that firebox with big pieces of wood that are going to burn low and slow and last all night. And a big chunk will last 10 hours. You feed it full of a bunch of smaller pieces, a lot of times the stove will burn hotter and the wood doesn't last as long. So, I don't split everything up into tiny pieces. So I won't be putting one of those on it, okay? Why did I buy a new splitter instead of fixing the old one? I thought you were frugal. All right, not everything in life is in black and white. Just because you're frugal doesn't mean you shouldn't spend money. You just gotta spend strategically, and that is being frugal, all right? I've put quite a bit of money into that old splitter, and I don't work on engines. I, I, I hate working on engines. Nuts and bolts, it's not me. So I've had enough, and I've got a lot of wood to split. So I bought a brand new one, which was a really smart move. It's given me tremendous joy so far. I put gas in it and started on the first pull. It splits wood like a champion, haha, <laughs> pardon the pun. And I'm going to do a review. When I'm all done splitting, I will do a review. But I want to give it a good, honest go first. But i got to tell you, <laughs> it's given me great joy running this log split. It's made me very happy. The manner that I purchased it in, which I explained in my other video, the log split is going to pay for itself in many ways. And I needed a tax deduction. And the log splitter is one. I might even buy another chainsaw, and that's going to be one. Okay? So, you guys see me fixing the camp. 
I just bought 28 more acres. I'm going to have an excavator come in and do some stumping. And all of this stuff, all of the improvements on the camp, all the money I'm spending, the log splitter, the Polaris Ranger, all of this stuff will be tax deductible. Okay? Being frugal doesn't mean you're not spending money. You just got to be strategic with it. Okay? All right. Next question. What are my favorite tires? My favorite tires for an automobile are General Grabber AT2s. Now, there's a few different General Grabber tires. I'm going to put these in the description below. You can see the ones I'm talking about. They are awesome tires. I have them on my 01 Cherokee. I have them on my Silverado. The only reason they're not on my 08 Cherokee is because that is nothing but a glorified grocery getter. The only thing grand about it is the price. And they don't make tires, these general grabbers, to fit that. So, anyway. Everything I buy will have general grabber AT2 tires. They're fantastic tires. Really good tread design, really solid tire. And they're aggressive enough, so they're great in the mud and great in the snow, and they're not loud. They don't make a racket when you're tooling down the highway. Good tire. Okay, one more. Uh, real popular question. How did Lori and I meet? <laughs> we met when I was traveling with the carnival circuit. I was running the Ferris wheel and she was working the ring toss and we hooked up. What are you saying? I never worked the carnival. <laughs> She's a carny. <laughs> no, I was working for a law firm, and Lori was up on manslaughter charges, and we got her out on an insanity plea. Oh, my goodness. I must be insane to be with you. <laughs> I found her wandering around the woods without a compass. She followed me out and followed me home, and she's never left. Will you just tell them the truth? <laughs> but seriously. Ah, oh, this was long before I had the New York cabin. I was going to New York on a hunting trip. And I, I looked online and I found a holiday craft fair in the area. And I loaded up my trailer and I towed that with me. And I did the fair while I was up there. That way I could write off the whole trip as a business expense, which I did. And I found a girlfriend. And uh, what can I say? The rest is history. But that is being frugal. Not only is it being frugal, it's just good backwoods logic. <laughs> so enjoy the rest of your Sunday, folks. All the best to you, and God bless. <laughs> Frankie and the boss out walking in the woods, living life happy and free. Tracks in the snow everywhere they go, there's a pokey way up in that tree. A beaver built a pond where they have some fun Taking life a day at a time Best friends until the end Frankie and the boss Frankie and the boss Frankie and the boss